cannabis common sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Our show is a production of our uh, political organization, CRRH, 501c3. Stands for the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. And our affiliated organization, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, or THCF. We have an exciting show for you tonight. Mr. Tim Pates here to provide musical accompaniment. How are you doing, Tim? I am doing just fine, Paul. How are you? Very well, very Good. well. Then uh, we have some film clips, a movie trailer. We'll be taking your phone calls. And as we always do, we'll start off with our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. <laughs> Welcome to our Hemp News segment. Tonight's first story is out of Los Angeles, California. California election officials on Wednesday affirmed that proponents of a statewide ballot measure to eliminate criminal penalties on the adult personal possession and cultivation of marijuana have gathered enough valid signatures to qualify for the 2010 November ballot. Proponents of the measure, the Regulate, Control, and Tax Cannabis Act of 2010, collected nearly 700,000 signatures in favor of the measure, over 60% more than the total number required for, by state law. The measure will allow adults 21 years or older to possess, share, or transport up to one ounce of cannabis for personal consumption and or cultivate the plant in an area not more than 25 square feet per private residence would also permit local governments the option to authorize the retail sale of marijuana and or commercial cultivation of cannabis to adults and to impose taxes on such sales. Personal marijuana cultivation or not-for-profit sales of marijuana would not be taxed under the measure. The proposal will continue to prohibit citizens from possessing marijuana on school grounds, consuming cannabis in public, or smoking while minors are present, or providing it to anyone under the age of 21 years old. The measure will not alter or amend any aspects of the California Health and Safety Code pertaining to the use of marijuana for medical purposes when such use is authorized by a physician. According to an April 2009 California field poll, 56% of the state voters back legalizing and regulating the adult use and sale of cannabis. The initiative proponents said in a prepared statement, quote, Right now, there is an estimated $15 billion in cannabis transactions every year in California, but since cannabis remains illegal, our state sees none of the revenue. Taxing and regulating cannabis could bring in billions of dollars in revenue to help fund what matters most in California, jobs, health care, schools, and libraries, parks, roads, transportation, and more, end quote. The immediate effect of passage of this measure would be to protect the individual from arrest if he or she possesses or grows a small amount of marijuana in the privacy of their own home. The long-term effect of this measure will be twofold. One, it will provide local governments with the option to regulate and tax the retail distribution of marijuana to adults in a manner similar to the way society controls alcohol. Such a change for those municipalities that opt in will raise revenue for local governments while simultaneously imposing necessary regulations and controls to the marijuana market. Two, local regulations will one day open the door for job creation, tourism, and the legitimization of an above-ground legal marijuana industry. This is a common-sense, physically responsible proposal that will raise revenue and reduce law enforcement costs and judicial costs without adversely impacting public safety. Our uh, next story tonight is from South Dakota, uh, Pierre, South Dakota. 
State officials in South Dakota announced last week that are proponents of a statewide South Dakota initiative to allow for physician-supervised use of medical marijuana have turned in sufficient signatures to qualify for this November's electoral ballot. Proponents of the measure, the South Dakota Coalition for Compassion, collected over twice the number of signatures necessary to place the proposal on the 2010 ballot. If approved by voters, Measure 13, the South Dakota Safe Access Act, would exempt state criminal penalties for the possession of up to one ounce of marijuana or six plants by authorized patients. According to Emmett Reistafaller, the coalition communication director, in a statement, he said, quote, the coalition could not be more proud of this truly grassroots accomplishment. Our members are united behind protecting the sick and the dying, and we now aim to educate the public about the various medical applications for cannabis before the election this November, end quote. In 2006, voters narrowly rejected a similar proposal, marking the only time that citizens of any state have rejected a statewide medical marijuana legalization proposal. Fourteen states have enacted medical marijuana laws since 1996, and out of those, ten have done so by voter initiative. Our last story tonight is out of Canada. Haynes brand's uh, underclothes is trying a new hip fiber based uh, product for size. A new fiber derived from part of the hemp plant typically discarded offers numerous environmental and performance benefits over cotton and is now being tested by Haynes brands. The Krayler fibers look fit, dye, wash, and are soft like cotton. But they also shrink less and are stronger and hold dyes longer said Ken Berker, the CEO of Naturally Advanced Technology, or NAT. Yarns and fabrics made from the fibers can even be processed on existing cotton machines. The fibers are derived from the hemp plant's stiff and rough outermost part, the bass fiber, which is generally discarded when turning hemp into clothing. Although it's illegal to grow industrial hemp in the United States, it is legal in Canada, where NAT is based. Nat takes those strong filaments from the plant and using a wash developed with the National Research Council of Canada, or the NRCC, turns them into fibers that are soft and strong. The wash, a proprietary enzyme mixture, removes the glue-like lignin and pectin from the raw hemp fibers. The yarns made from the fibers can be used in knit and woven fabrics like clothing and home furnishings or in woven fabrics like face wipes and industrial cleaning wipes. Nat's been working with various companies to test how these fibers will work in different applications. Haynes Brands has conducted trials blending Krayler into products and recently made a purchase of 10,000 pounds of the material for further tests. Although this fiber costs more than conventional cotton, the Haynes brand test showed that the material's shrink resistance and dye retention properties would reduce manufacturing costs to a point that would even out the additional costs of this new fiber. Haynes brand started working with hemp fiber in late 2008, first testing to make sure the fibers could be used on modern equipment. When that proved successful, Haynes brand started additional tests in June 2009. By making a blend of 80% cotton and 20% hemp, Haynes brands made items that had 50% less shrinkage and increased strength and moisture wicking. Although the tests are keeping hemp fiber at 20% of the overall material in the product, Barker said it's possible to bump that up to 50% or higher. The hemp fibers being tested in other applications like industrial yarns and wipes by Patrick Yarns and Georgia Pacific. And because the fibers come from the hemp plant, they provide even more environmental benefits than organic cotton does over conventional cotton and other fibers. Hemp plants don't need fertilizers or pesticides, nor do they need any irrigation. They can grow 14 feet tall within four months, and one acre of hemp can absorb five times as much carbon dioxide as an acre of forest land. According to Barker, quote, hemp right now grows voraciously. From a productivity and efficiency perspective, hemp has a biomass yield unlike anything else, end quote. Whereas cotton growers can get about a ton of material per acre, hemp growers can get three to five tons per acre. Barker said the entire process can be certified organic and has already been certified by EcoCert and other groups in Europe and North America. The enzymes used in the wash are all naturally occurring, he said, and the only byproduct is drinkable water. I think this gives a whole new meaning to that old 70s ad slogan, Hanes makes you feel good all under. So 
that's the end of our hip news segment for tonight. <laughs> I look forward to buying those underwear myself. What do you think, Tim? You know what? I, that that last news article was fascinating to me when I think about uh, all the the ways that we we discovered uh, uh, the products that we could have invented during the '90s when I was at Condi's and the CNS Specialty Builder Supply. You know, and yeah. Him you know, I recently saw a documentary from 1995 we're going to have to get copies of it and play it here on the show yeah that had an interview with thomas maloney from sure. washington yes. state uh yes wood products uh, laboratory where yep. he had developed those hemp boards right. along with condi and you yes. folks and they interviewed me for a good segment of it when i was selling my tree-free eco paper hemp that's paper. part of it yeah and uh, that whole process it, you know that that last story it reminded me of when we first uh we first uh created the first legal grow in North America was in Canada, mm -hmm. Joe Strobel, uh, mm -hmm. and he you know, did it through the Parliament, uh, the Canadian Parliament, but I was the one there at Condi's that he called first and said, hey, can I do this? And I said, why not? Let's try. And now it's legal all over everywhere. And, and, and the delignification process that they're talking about there of, of you know, breaking down the bast fibers that you said, uh, that's actually a very simple process. It's, it's, it's uh, hydrogen peroxide is what's used. Uh, the advantage is that that uh, when you break it down, you don't create the dioxins that they do yeah, in the wood products. Yeah, that you do through the chlorination industry. process. Yeah, so it's 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 a whole cleaner process, and and uh, and, and it's really easy to break those pro those uh, uh, those individual fibers down with the right chemical, that, and it's non toxic. So uh, you know, in the long run, we are going to make some major changes as this progresses, and as we legalize here on the West Coast. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm very pleased about all this. I am. Uh, that was a good story. Can you tell we're excited, folks? We are excited. We're excited. Uh, that was a very excited. To me, that's very exciting when you when you get mainstream with material. It, it hits close to home when they talk about underwear, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> okay. Very well, Tim, you've got some songs for you us know, tonight. You know, I know you do. You know, everybody sit back and watch watch the pretty pictures. From the THCF Medical Gardens, I might add. Tim Pate, the original compositions to entertain us there. Like, hey there, hi there. Welcome to the show. Uh, we are taking your calls. If you have a question or comment for us, Nike call at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. We do have a caller. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Hey, you sweat a lot, fatso. He got it in early this time. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a guy at uh, a local radio station. Uh huh. I think it's K. I don't remember. KGON or no, not KGON. KUFO. That's it. KUFO. I've been told a shock jock out there uh -huh. likes to watch our show and other cable access TV shows and make rude comments and record them and play them on the radio station. Oh. So, for you folks who who listen to KUFO out there. Keep a watch out for this guy because we're going to sue him for violating our copyright. 
So, uh, oh, cool. Yeah, he can't just take our show and play it on his show for entertainment values. He owes us money. KUFO owes us money. Hey, interesting. What do you think of that guy? <laughs> Hey, turnabout's fair play. You know. One back at you. You know, we are out there streaming on the Internet, and uh, yeah, I do perspire a lot. I've always perspired a lot, but, you yeah. know, what the hell? Yeah. I mean, Hey, if they can't see you sweat, you're not working. Yeah, that's right. That's I right. mean, you know, don't sweat it, bro. Anyway, we are uh, uh, taking your questions online on Ustream. So you can actually type in questions on Ustream, where we're streaming live all over the world, and... Have a question. So we have our first question from Ustream tonight. It's uh, who attempted to appeal the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act ballot title and why? Well, we can say that a fellow named Bradley Benoit appealed our ballot title. Huh. And we aren't 100% certain why. We have some sneaking suspicions. But, those, but are, those are sneaking suspicions. That's all. And so I wouldn't validate those by airing them unless I was sure. But... Uh, there's a process where anyone can challenge a ballot title, and our ballot title was challenged, which held up the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act petition drive by about 30 days. However, I'm happy to announce that yesterday the Supreme Court rejected the challenge and said it was without merit. They weren't even going to write an opinion about the ballot title challenge. And so... Uh, uh, there you have it. Our ballot is out, and we should be hitting the streets with the Octa petition about this time next week. So stay tuned and get some of our petitions, because we are working, just as we have the vote that we were talking about in California, we're working to uh, put this thing on the ballot in Oregon to end adult marijuana prohibition, restore industrial hemp, and help medical marijuana patients. So stay tuned, and we'll be uh, out there with our petitions, and we can certainly use your help on that. So uh, you can come by our petition office at 520, or 5220, that's it, 5220 Northeast Sandy Boulevard. And uh, we'll be happy to help you get involved in our campaign. We have until July 2nd to gather about 125,000 signatures. So we're going to be doing that in a paid petition drive in conjunction with a volunteer petition drive. So there you have it. If you have a question or a comment for us tonight, give us a call. And you're not a shock jock. And you're not a shock jock at KFUO trying to other violate our copyright, you know. <laughs> uh, I guess guys must be jealous. He must be jealous, That's you know, because right. he's on some obscure radio station. We have an audience probably 100 times larger well, than we his. we are coast to coast now. So. And we're coast to coast, so it's probably his only opportunity to get coast to coast. So. That's true. Yeah, I just, uh, you know. Hey. You know, what do you do? I mean, uh, you you know, Don Rickles, that's I think, right. does better at insulting It's okay. You'll get more attention by being sued. That's all right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We have a caller. Welcome <laughs> to the show, caller. Hey, how you doing? I had a question for you. If, okay. Uh, hold on. Let me turn my TV on so I can hear you guys. If, uh, <laughs> no, you can hear us through the phone, can't you? Oh, yeah, I can hear you through the phone. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Okay, I'm looking right at you on TV. Okay, listen, if you're on parole or probation and you got your medical marijuana card, but the parole and probation officers are saying, no, you can't smoke medical marijuana, if you get Marinol, a doctor pre to prescribe you Marinol, does that Marinol synthetic THC show up the same as if you, let's say, did smoke something? In THC? most tests, Marinol does show up the same. However, there are some advanced tests that cost 800 to $2,000 they can uh, detect other uh, cannabinoid metabolites. And so, so I, I doubt that they are going to employ uh, such an expensive test on uh, a regular probationary or parolee. So, uh, okay. however, that said, I think the safest thing to do is if your probation or parole officer will not allow you to use medical marijuana, you should right. get a lawyer and go to the judge. And the judge will order the probation and parole department to follow the medical marijuana law. And so well, that's probably will, huh? the best alternative because yes. then you don't have to worry about uh, the, you know, the probation or parole officer uh, well, coming up with some random... Mine just told me, because I do have my medical marijuana card, that if you went and got Marinol, I'm cool with that. Just yeah. bring up the prescription and show it to me and then... He probably wouldn't. He just all right. Well, if that's what he said, then that sounds like the easy way for you to go then. So, but my one question is pretty much: if you can turn all, you're good to go. And have to put out, especially if your probation officer or parole officer told you you are. Yeah. 
So synthetic marinol THC shows up the same as THC, period. It's not synthetic yeah. THC, is it? No, no. Yeah. I mean, even synthetic THC shows up in a urinalysis test yeah. as, as THC. I mean, okay. it's the same thing. But uh, it, 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 there's no way to differentiate between synthetic the THC in, in marinol capsules and organic THC. Now, there are some tests out there. Once again, I said they're very expensive, and they're not running a typical drug screen. They can differentiate, but the no, odds are highly that, against no. they're going to spend that kind of money to, to run one of those tests. Right they're now, pretty rare. They test, they test your, your, All right. your fatty tissues in your body. And it, okay, you answered my question. Well, in, in your heard. fatty tissues, cannabis is, is uh, fat-soluble, oil-soluble, so it stays in your fatty tissues a little longer and takes a little bit longer right. to eliminate so, those metabolites from your system. And so. as you take the Marinol pills every day... Let's it's the same thing. Those day pills day are day expensive, day. so you want to be careful how many of them you're taking. But definitely, uh, they can't tell the difference between that and they organic told, cannabis. I have a scheduled appointment. I'm not going to say when it is. And the guy told me it's only $75 to see the doctor. It's a one-time fee for six months, and that includes the prescription. That sounds right to me. You know, our show is a non-commercial show. We do this through cable access, so we can't really talk about costs and prices. And You know, we show products, but we're doing these kind of just to talk about industrial hemp. And so uh hope that answers your questions. The Marinol for employers who are against medical marijuana smokers, period. I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, and you guys have a wonderful day. I enjoy oh, your show. Too. You guys do a wonderful job. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. If We have a... Uh, audience member question so we'll get the sound guy to get that microphone up to speed and we'll go ahead and take your question go right ahead hi i'm dennis and i'm uh patient on uh my uh, i had a stroke two and a half years ago and um smoking uh marijuana helps me a lot uh because i had a stroke and a seizures and stuff like that yeah, it definitely helps with seizures and spasms and other things, the dystonic movements that might occur if you're having some kind of spasm. And I can helps control those. Like, I was drinking a lot. Uh huh. So, Before you had this accident or the stroke? No, 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 no. Like, like that wasn't the accident. Like before that, I was too. Uh, Lowe's, uh, forestry, uh, uh, and, uh, school at the time, and then fucking the accident, but, um, drinking okay. alcohol is much more debilitating than cannabis, there's than no doubt about anything that. anything else that could ever kill anyone, you yeah, know what I'm saying? amen. Well, I mean, they say so many you know thousands of deaths like, are caused through alcohol consumption each year herb and helps a lot of fucking people and uh, sorry about the language <laughs> that's okay well listen thanks we, for your comment we really appreciate you hanging in there and uh, we're glad that medical second. marijuana is useful for you we uh we uh alcohol is stimulant and and uh excuse me uh and a yeah, it's a debilitating, uh, uh, it's kind of like, uh, what do they call it, a depressant. That's what it is. No, but, uh, it's a depressant. It kind of knocks you out if you take too much of it. No, it's a uh, non, um, you know what I'm saying. Uh, okay, thank you for coming in and, and having your... Herb, you know what I'm saying. Okay, thank you, man. Yes. All right, if you are out there and you have a question or a comment, you can call us at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. And we will be very happy to take your questions and comments. We have another question online from Cottage Grove, Oregon. What's the difference between California and Oregon's legalization initiatives? Well, in California, their law would allow personal possession of up to one ounce or cultivation of a 25-square-foot garden. And it would also allow county and municipal governments to set up regulations and tax and regulate marijuana. 
Now our Oregon proposal sets up the uh, license system and the regulation system so that marijuana could be cultivated and sold almost immediately through state licensed stores. And it doesn't set limits on the amount of marijuana that an individual can possess or grow for personal use. So uh, Oregon's law would put the regulation and control of marijuana in the hands of a new state government commission, the Cannabis Control Commission, while California's bill simply would allow adults to possess up to an ounce and grow up to a 25 square foot garden and then it would allow counties and municipal governments to regulate and tax marijuana. So uh, the Oregon bill would immediately regulate it where California's would require further movement by the uh, city and county governments. And again there are no limits under Oregon's bill on how much a person can cultivate and under California's new bill, which is qualified for a vote, uh, it would allow one ounce of, to be possessed and up to 25 square feet. You know, I got a question to follow up with that. Then. Sure. Uh, you know, based upon what you just said, it, it, it doesn't seem like the California uh, uh, initiative is actually legalizing it; it's just regulated to a degree. Well, it, throw, no, it wouldn't be illegal for an adult to possess up to an ounce, and yeah. currently, it is illegal for an adult to possess that up to To me, an that's, that just creates and even more problems. And to grow your own, too. Yep. And now it's illegal for you to grow your own. It changes the problems. Where Oregon's, yeah, I think, there you go. solves the problem entirely, yes. California's kind of semi-solves it and gives the counties and the cities yeah. a method where they might solve it in the future. Well, that's where so I was some, going with that question. Yeah, because some I counties see it that way and cities too. like Oakland and and Berkeley and San Francisco, they're obviously going to jump on the bandwagon yeah. and it'll be legal pretty quickly. But in other counties like San Diego and San Bernardino and Riverside right. counties in California, uh, it could be years or more before this, the county governments uh, start implementing some legal control. There was an interesting article in the Oregonian on the front page today. Uh, and it was discussing the growers in Humboldt County, ba basically stating that they had uh, they had issues. They were afraid that if it became legal, uh, they would lose their income. They mm -hmm. would lose their their right to grow. You know, uh, they, they, the the that, market that would be flooded of, in. That it's kind like, of I was thing kinda, doesn't Whoa. affect me. You know, I think that's kind of ridiculous. These are people who are saying they are too stupid to know how to operate in a legal environment. Right. They can only operate <laughs> if they, they have the laws against yeah. them, and they can only make yeah. a profit as long as it's legal, and they're just too dumb to figure out how to work in a legal world. And I'm, so, I also am afraid that they're, they're, they're afraid they're going to lose their black market price range. That's what they're worried about. That's the bottom line. And the thing is... Amen. We don't want a black market no price range. It should right. be cheap. I'm for the $10 ounce. Amen. Bring back the $10 ounce. Here, here. Does anybody agree? Want. Yeah. There you go. What the heck with these? We have an overflowing uh, audience ounces. tonight, as you can you can hear. We have a live audience on a weekly basis, but this week it's the place is packed, and, and that's always a and nice thing. And you're welcome to come down any uh, Friday night and observe our TV show here and be an audience member. Uh, we have a film clip we're going to run, uh, and then we'll be taking another call in just a second. So stay tuned. As a former police officer, I believe that the prohibition of marijuana is one of the most ridiculous abuses of our allocation of police, staff, and money that we could possibly have. The great myth of prohibition is that prohibition doesn't mean you control drugs. It means you give up the right to control drugs. Of course I don't want to find marijuana in my daughter's room, but I'd certainly not want to see her arrested and with a criminal record the rest of her life. The most dangerous thing about marijuana is to be arrested for its possession or use. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Steves, travel writer and your host. I've found that challenging one's own preconceived notions and engaging in open and honest conversations with others is one of the beauties of travel. In fact, it's fundamental to good travel. 
Today, I'll take you and our studio audience on a guided tour through the history of this country's marijuana laws. Along the way, we'll learn about the fascinating people and events that are responsible for the marijuana laws we live with today. We'll also hear from scientists and doctors, police officers and judges, and people just like you who are questioning whether those laws are working for us or actually working against us. I've been a medical marijuana patient for about two and a half months now. I started using it because of the effects I was having from my chemotherapy and my surgery after my ovarian cancer was diagnosed. I have not taken any opiates in over two months. I haven't taken any of their prescribed anti-nausea drugs. Since I've been in chemotherapy, I've had chemo nurses who've asked me uh, that I've told that I was a medical marijuana patient and have asked me for information because they've had other patients ask them and they have no information. I think there's a lot of fear among the medical community. I think there's a lot of misinformation. Um, and it's, you know, because it is, a, it is the drug war. And, and a lot of people are just scared of, of touching it. Just want to, you know, distance themselves as much as possible from it just because of the, the legal issues. Carolyn lives in one of the 13 states that have passed laws permitting the medical use of marijuana. Well, if she lives in a medical marijuana state, then why are her doctors and nurses afraid to talk to her about it? That's a great question, and it's best answered by one of our guest panelists. Joining us are Deborah Small, who's the founder and executive director of the national drug policy organization called Break the Chains, retired Superior Court Judge David Nichols, and Allison Holcomb, director of the American Civil Liberties Union's Marijuana Education Project. Allison, why don't we start with you? Why would Carolyn's doctors and nurses be afraid to talk to her about medical use of marijuana if she lives in a state where it's already legal? The short answer, Rick, is the federal government. There are now 13 states that have passed medical marijuana laws, but the federal government doesn't recognize them. In those states, patients that want to use medical marijuana are threatened and harassed by the federal government, and the doctors that would authorize it for them are too scared to. For people like Carolyn, it's a very big problem. And it's really ironic because since 1978, our government has been giving, the federal government has been giving medical marijuana to patients, but at the same time, this federal government is also attacking state medical marijuana laws and the people who choose to try to implement them. It's an incredible hypocrisy that's caused great hardship on a number of people around the country. Federal drug marijuana laws are not based on science. It's intentional government ignorance, I, th I think, put out there. And uh, Dr. Lyle Craker from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst is involved in a long legal hassle. I finally got a decision allowing him to proceed with his research, but the Drug Enforcement Administration continues to stonewall the research. We visited Professor Craker, the man at the center of this controversy. My name is Lyle Craker. I'm a professor at the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences in the University of Massachusetts. Our primary research and educational outreach is in medicinal plants. One of the key plants that we've been working with is, is black cohosh. Currently this plant is collected in the Appalachian region and sold uh, commercially as a dietary supplement for use by menopausal women uh, to relieve the, the symptoms of menopause. 25 or 30 percent of the current medicines on the market are plants or plant-derived. I look at marijuana as no different than any other medicinal plant we've worked with. Uh, and what we want to do is, is to do the best thing for the public. And the best thing for the public is to do the research to see, to, to either prove yes or prove no that this plant material has beneficial health effects. To me, this is no different than anything else we've looked at, except that we're restricted. We can't look at it, and that's the big problem. I think that the point we're getting at is that we only learn about how plants can be used is if we, if we do the scientific research that's necessary. Okay, that is an excerpt from Marijuana. It's time for a conversation hosted by PBS travel writer Rick Steves. And uh, uh, it's available in DVD, and it's produced by the... A uh, drug policy project of uh, the American Civil Liberties Union of Washington State. And so it's a great video. We'll be playing more clips of that as time goes by. And uh, uh, it's, it's out there to be viewed in its entirety on our website at CannabisTaxAct.org. That's CannabisTaxAct.org. 
we have a, uh, a question in our studio audience that we'll be taking next. So uh, go ahead with that question. All right. Hi, Paul. Howdy. I have a statement and a warning for people out there. Uh, Oregon go right ahead. Uh, OMMP is now charging $10 for replacement cards, even if you're low income or the uh, ah. Oregon health plan, they'll still charge you $10 per card, $30 if you lose them all. Okay. Just thought I'd warn people out there. Right. That's a good thing to know. I didn't even know about that. Right on. Thank you for the warning. Yeah. Uh, I also heard something today about a patient that was uh, cut off his narcotics uh, from his uh, doctor due, uh -huh. to, due to having a, med a medical marijuana card. I see. And I heard from a doctor that uh, there's a possibility of combining opiates with the uh, uh, marijuana increasing the efficacy of the opiates to the point where they would could, could uh, OD. Is, is this a viable? No, that is not true. It would not have any effect on altering the effect of the opiates to such a degree that it would change the uh, heart rate or breathing rate. Uh, opium in an, or opiates in themselves can do that, but combining cannabis wouldn't have any effect upon that. All right, thank you, Paul. There's no effect on the cerebellum and those functions of breathing and heartbeat the way that opiates do. Our streaming uh, texture out there, according to our, our live show on Ustream, uh, and you can watch us live anywhere in the world, we have a viewer coming from Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada. Oh, right on. So we're out there all across North America and probably the whole world. And we have another caller on the telephone. Hello, caller. You're on our show. Hey guys. Hey. 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 Um. I have a, a, a two-part question. Uh, okay. I was interested in knowing if um, if 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 you have a card and you're driving with marijuana and uh, and if you get pulled over and they happen to smell something, uh, if you could be prosecuted for having you know for driving impaired. And yes, you and can. My, and my second part of that question is, I, I was wondering when the last time you saw your dick. There you go. Well, you know, there's just some crazy people out there, uh, you know, so uh, we should have asked that person for their phone number and called them back. But we have another uh, studio audience question. Hello, studio audience member. Welcome to our show. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Um, great show tonight. I have two things. Uh, first thing I wanted to comment on, but I wanted to wait a couple of months before I commented on it. Um, several months ago, somebody kind of turned me into DHS saying that I was uh, uh, doing drugs around my children and stuff like that and it was a real hassle um, but I also wanted to comment that I have been a medical marijuana card holder for several years and uh, they investigated me quite thoroughly and totally didn't hassle me at all and told me I was doing the right thing and and so there is a lot of people out there that work for the state that are promoting, you know, people doing the right thing with it. Right on. So That's good. I wanted to comment on that. It's been several months. If you're months, a good so. parent, uh, they should observe that, that, whether you use marijuana or you don't. So I'm glad that uh, they found uh, that it uh, didn't affect your ability to take care of your children. Cool. Thanks. And then so the other thing, I wanted to get back to what was on the show earlier um, mm -hmm. about the taxation of marijuana with uh -huh. the current laws in California and in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't quite figure out, are they going to tax you on how many plants you grow or on your 25 square foot little area or is it just on the sale? Yeah, in both Oregon and why and uh, our law that hasn't qualified for a vote yet, and the law that's just qualified for a vote in California, there is no tax on personal private production and possession of marijuana. So there would be no tax on what you can grow yourself. Under the new California uh, proposal that's up for a vote this coming November, uh, you could grow and possess up to one ounce and have a garden up to 25 square feet there wouldn't be any tax on that but the county and city governments could impose taxation and regulation on the sale of marijuana and the same is true here with our Oregon Cannabis Tax Act petition there is no tax or a license fee or permit needed to grow your own under our Oregon Cannabis Tax Act also there uh, 
There's no fee involved. Uh, you only need a license and uh, to pay a tax when uh, you want to sell marijuana through the legal distribution system. I guess we have another question from a studio audience member. Go right ahead. Hi, I just got my uh, card and started my first grow. I'm still at the metal halide vegetation stage. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I'm a little confused uh, uh, about the law. You're allowed 12 plants. I'm sorry, six plants that are large and they can all be in flower. And then what happens when your starts uh, inevitably go above 12 inches? Because, I mean, they're kind of light hungry and that's what they do. Well, what you have to do is you have to trim them back, aggressively trim them back. You can make cuttings and give those away to other patients or you can just throw that away. Also, the leaf, while it doesn't have THC, does have CBD. And CBD is the active component for pain, spasm, seizures, glaucoma, neurodegenerative diseases, and gastrointestinal ailments. So the leaves are useful for that. They won't get anyone high, but they will take care of pain, spasm, seizures, and those other conditions. And as far as your six large plants, how large can they get? And There's no limit on the size of those six plants. Those, under Oregon's law, you can grow a total of 24 plants, but only six of them can be larger or taller than one foot. And there is no limit on those six. Also, uh, up to six of them can be flowering or budding at one time. So what you might want to do is flower five and have one mother plant and then have your mother plant ready to take your cuttings uh, once the other five are harvestable and then you can replace them with uh, new clones from that mother plant. Maybe flower the mother plant at that point. Cool. I'm pulling out my pruning scissors then. Thanks. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for that question. We're going to try the telephone call system here again. I don't think uh, our screener is going to let that happen again. So, uh, welcome to the show, caller. Hi. Yeah, I'm not the the, the idiot who just called in. Um, cool, man. I just I just wanted to uh, to ask uh, if uh, I'd heard um, a few months ago uh, Jack Carrere was on the uh, the show before he got really ill. Yeah, he and, was at uh, our Hipstock Festival and he suffered a massive heart attack and. Uh, had brain damage due to oxygen deprivation while he's being resuscitated. Yeah, and so he's, he's uh, doing recently Definitely. moved back down to California and is living in his home, but he still isn't able to talk and is feeding through a, a you know if a tube and things like that. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, I just wanted to ask. He had mentioned something um, about in California. He had uh, his, his, he put it as a, a thousand percent legalization. That, uh, that everyone who was in jail or who had, who, had, who had been put in jail for laws like simple possession and, and whatnot would be let out. And I was wondering if we could put something through. I don't know about it, if it would be you know, able to be put in, into this bill at all or uh, initiative at all, but, but if we could do something through that would do that or if this bill would, would do anything with that because that would definitely be a, a, a step to take. Just a yeah, statement to bring all of those people out of jail that shouldn't be in jail that are you know put in jail for, You're right. for growing and using absolutely and just being citizens you know yeah well, once you you know when you when you craft laws uh, you have to grandfather in uh, into those laws you know provisions for those people who are in jail now for the reason you know you're now making this law no longer you know valid and and uh, I think it I think your point is a good point and and we're gonna have to address that because it's going to be legalized we are going to legalize this and when we do uh, what do we do about all those people who are in jail for what we just made legal for everyone else I think yeah, it's a should, valid right, question they should rightfully be, be let out, and uh, and and even in some cases uh, where their property and, and whatnot was taken away, oh they my, should uh, yeah. be reimbursed. Yeah, I can agree with that. Uh, I, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Thanks for uh, your guys' show. Uh, I appreciate what you guys do. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your question. Bye. We have another call for. I mean, uh, a studio audience member with another question. There you go. Hey, welcome back to the well, show. Act actually, this is just kind of a continuation comment on the uh, the subject a moment ago of uh, of uh, keeping a mama uh, one of the one of the larger of your six as a mama. I know um, it it takes a lot of skill and a, and a lot of experience to to start a large clone off of a large mama. But something that I, I know a lot of people have sat, had success with is is the. Uh, the centuries-old process of, of cultivating trees, the, the bonsai technique, to, sure. to stunt your plants and to shape them into something that will 
grow prolific prolifically sure but and, and produce a lot of uh of well you you would still have to aggressively prune it the same way right but you'd be able to keep your mama alive indefinitely with with uh, on a minimal su- support system yeah by keep by keeping it kind of to a bonsai trimming stage and and one of the advantages the to that plant. is that you get a lot of fresh growth a lot of uh really soft green new growth that'll clone really really quickly Okay. Well, thanks for that tip. I appreciate that. Interesting. I mean, you got to get them somehow. Yeah. Hey, we have another uh, question out there from Ustream, and that is out of St. Helens, Oregon. When cannabis is rescheduled in Oregon, how will that affect uh, workplace drug testing? Uh, That remains to be seen. When marijuana is completely legalized, whether it be through our Cannabis Tax Act petition or something else, uh, obviously, that'll change the dynamic of workplace drug testing, but it remains to be seen exactly how it will do so. But I would say for certain, when marijuana is legal, it will change uh, the way uh, employment drug testing takes place. But it's, and I think it will throw it out entirely for cannabis, but uh, uh, that remains to be seen. Now, the State Pharmacy Board is, has been mandated to yeah. uh, readdress They've this. They've got a hearing order. coming up on the 18th of May Okay, uh, over here at 800 Northeast Oregon Street. And the, under Senate Bill 728, the uh, Oregon Board of Pharmacy will be rescheduling marijuana out of Schedule 1 mm-hmm. to either Schedule 2, 3, 4, or 5. five. And they will be doing five. that sometime five later by the summer. I think they're going to issue their proclamation in June. Five is like place. Band-Aids? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a film clip we're going to run, and uh, just a short little trailer for a new upcoming movie called The Green Goddess. I'm an associate producer in this movie and uh, have a little bit part in there as well. So, But I'm not in this clip, but I hope you enjoy it. This is a, a film trailer for an upcoming film that will start screening this summer called The Green Goddess. The following trailer contains real marijuana. Legend has it that deep within the THC crystal of the marijuana plant, there lives a goddess. A goddess so incredible that meeting her will transform your life forever. She's magnificent, glorious, beautiful, delicious. I want to meet her. You start with a strain like this, nurture her. Worship her. When your mind is open, she will come. When their leader is arrested, three friends will travel halfway across the world, plant 25,000 marijuana plants, and harvest more organic ganja than you and all of your friends could smoke in three times. Whoa, that's a lot of pot. America. See? You just come over to you, grow some weed, and a whole bunch of money. It doesn't work. Huh? All I know is after how some of y'all treated the son, the Lord felt the need to hide his daughter. And he hid her in the most sacred of secret places. chance get it right and to meet one goddess would you like to meet the green goddess all right so stay tuned for that movie we'll be showing uh uh a version of that in the coming as a benefit for our oregon cannabis tax act petition so stay tuned for upcoming screenings and the whole movie will start screening officially a little bit later this summer we have another caller out there. Welcome to our show, caller. Hi. Howdy. How are you doing tonight? Good. Pretty well. Um, uh, my question is, you commented on how you get the THC when you smoke the flower, and out of the leaves you get the cannabinoids for yeah. pain. Do you have to ingest that? It works better when you ingest it. You don't have to ingest it. But, uh, for instance, with vaporization, studies have shown that vapor, which is an alternative to smoking, where... Combust, 
uh, heat is forced through cannabis at sub-combustion temperatures below the level of combustion. Uh, fire, you know, and combustion takes place at about 451 degrees Fahrenheit. And at about 360 degrees, the uh, active ingredients in marijuana vaporize. So in the vaporization process, they've shown that it's 96% THC, 2% CBD, and 1% each of two different terpenes or uh, aromatic hydrocarbons. And so uh, you get more THC through inhalation, but to get a larger dose of CBD, which is the anti-pain component, an anti-spasm and uh, uh, seizure component of cannabis, it works better to eat the cannabis. It lasts longer as well. It lasts uh, six to 10 hours when eaten and when uh, smoked or vaporized, it only lasts one to four hours. Okay, and do you feel that the little vaporizer, ceramic vaporizer pipes um, activated enough so you can just go ahead and put that in a capsule and then... Um, yeah, yeah, generally it does. It doesn't take much to uh, get decarboxylization or activation to happen. Uh, when cannabis has been cured, it isn't completely medicinal activated until uh, the carbon dioxide molecule stripped off, and that happens at a low heat at about 200, and, 200 to 215 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. And You're welcome. I really feel sorry for those people who make the rude calls. Yeah, they're just trying to ruin our show, you know? Um, they can't ruin your show. You've yeah. got a great show, and you're Thanks. helping a lot of people. Thank you. And, I appreciate um, it. And a lot more needs to be said about the problems that are caused by alcohol, and you don't have those caused by marijuana at it's all. True. It's true. It's true. Marijuana is much safer than alcohol ever has been. So. Ever has Unfortunately, been. if we got into the, the negative alcohol type show, we would spend all of our time on that because of all of the damages that it does. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I would have loved to have made more comments when we had that comment earlier because I ran a crisis center 17 years and I, I don't even want to get into how many problems were created by misuse of drugs, especially alcohol. Uh, well, I chose a marijuana over alcohol over 50 years ago and... I'm glad. I bet you are. I'm glad too. Yeah, yeah, we uh, all are. I didn't. I didn't leave my family or kill anyone or kill myself. Thank there you God. go. And so I'm happier for that. You guys I mean, do a good job, and thanks. thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, comments and questions here. We Bye -bye. appreciate it. Good evening. We're down to just a few short minutes to go here. We have a little show and tell segment here. We have a locally produced product from Canadian. Uh, hemp, hemp munch. This is hull, uh, our hemp seed with its hulls. You can actually see it in there. Oh, let's see. Hemp munch from Emerald Hemp, which is produced right here in uh, Oregon. And, uh, but it's from Canadian hemp. Then we have Hemp Dream, hemp milk. And another hemp milk product here uh, from uh, Living Harvest. They've recently added a new container to their product. They call it Tempt. This is their old container, uh, hemp milk. And then we have a, a non-sweetened version. Three different kinds. This one's from Manitoba Harvest. Hemp uh, Bliss hemp milk. And then last but not least, we have our big container of hulled hemp seeds, which takes the outer crunchy uh, hull off the marijuana plant and just uses the, the inner uh, nut-like uh, interior. Tastes good, like a cross between uh, walnuts and sunflower seeds or cashews. So you, you should try that. We constantly want to promote our hemp products out here, and that's one way we do it, by educating you about the various things. And one other thing, last but not least, we have this American flag made from hemp fiber. 100% hemp fiber American flag, the old glory, just like the original ones that were made for uh, until they started using cotton in the 1820s and the 1850s. Anyway, we're down to just a couple minutes left, and we're going to go out with Mr. Tim Page music and some more pictures from our THCF Medicinal Gardens. Hope you've enjoyed our show tonight. I uh, want to thank you all for watching. Stay tuned out there for our new Oregon Cannabis Tax Act petitions. Those are going to be available here in Oregon in, uh, the, in about a week. 
And if you're out there and you are looking for a doctor to help you get medical marijuana, we have doctors all over the country that can help you. Just call us toll-free in Portland at 1-800-723-0188. That's 1-800-723-0188. We have a physician referral service for physicians all over the country. Or if you're in the Portland area, you can call us at 503 235 46 Zero six. You know, we think it is time to end the legal lies about marijuana and legalize marijuana and restore hemp. So I want to thank you for watching. Tune in next week. It's Tim Pate. Next week, folks. <laughs>